right, no, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think comfort is necessary. It possibly makes it easier because there are examples of great um, humanit humanitarian uh, gestures um, in things like the concentration camps. So these very definite words, necessary, but yes, of course it would make it easier. Um, no, again, the poor are not by necessity uh, or inevitably uh, lean towards um, less virtuous lives. I think that's an awful thing to say. Um, it really is very much an individual thing and an individual response and everybody's capable. Um, but of course it's not easy to be virtuous when you're up against it and you're tempted much more. Um, and I'd hope that people can lead a more generous existence if they have got uh, money, um, but not necessarily. Some of them can be absolutely awful. Um, then, yes, I do agree that there's a greater temptation uh, to keep your money and to keep comfortable. Of course there is. Um, is anyone intrinsically good enough to live a, uh, a yeah, life without corruption? I would hope so, but I think we have to be aware of the fact that we can all be tempted, we can all, uh, we are all vulnerable, we are all people who can, um, particularly if you're in difficult situations, you can respond uh, by doing the wrong thing. But um, generalisations, I don't like generalisations, there's no always or never in life. And I think that if you've got money, I would hope that one would take your morality with you and uh, not be tempted away. Now, in desperate times, what would I do to survive? I would, if for myself, as an ancient old lady, well, I, if I die, I die. I've had a very good life, a very happy life. But if I was defending my children or my grandchildren, I'd do anything. I've always thought I would kill in order to get food for them or to protect them. The one thing that I would hope that I would never do, but I've always got to be aware, we've always got to be aware that we could, anybody could, is I hope I wouldn't torture another human being in order to protect them. But I don't know in the circumstances if they were threatening my children or my grandchildren. One doesn't know, one's got to be aware that any of us any of us can do the things that we would hate to know that we've done. I am very fortunate to have been born in one of the oldest living cultures of the world, the Jain culture. People like Mahatma Gandhi have drawn a lot of inspiration and wisdom from our philosophy and as you know he is regarded as one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century. The work that I do is informed by my culture, it's inspired by my culture, it has a strong creative element uh, it has a strong leadership dimension and uh, it has a spiritual dimension also. But most importantly, what I want to do is to share my culture and values with others because I feel that they are not just for people from the Jain community, but they are for the whole world. Just to give you a tiny example, thousands of years ago, the Jains believed that each and every living being is worthy of respect. So our philosophy is based on deep non-violence, what we call ahimsa, and we live our life with that value in mind. As a result, we have very little difficulty making friends because we have no enemies.
we have very little difficulty running organizations because people are drawn to our lived example, to our character, our creativity, our hospitality, our love and compassion. And I feel that the whole world could benefit from such a philosophy because we are becoming increasingly segregated in many ways in our thinking, in our friends uh, and in our activities and operations. Uh, we are classifying, some people are disabled, some people are black, some people are uh, you know, women, some people are old and we are saying we should respect old people, we should respect black people, we should respect everyone just as we want to be respected by everyone and yes we can do that and we will find that our own life will be the richer for it. I certainly have discovered that and through my work with the social enterprise Diverse Ethics I work with all kinds of leaders to help them see the power and potential of diversity and to move from any fears insecurities or prejudices about working and with people from different backgrounds and people from different cultures. Well for me ethics is a very complicated issue. I think in the UK we have quite high ethical standards but when you look globally um, it's really worrying what you see particularly in countries like Syria with the war going on there now and Afghanistan, the way women are treated. I think we're quite lucky in the UK, the, the ethical standards we have. But there's a lot more to do to improve society. And I think one of the ways we can do that is get communities to work better together. It's not just about money and how much people have. It's also about how much people can look after one another. Um, for me, probably the biggest ethical dilemma uh, is the way the economy works, particularly with uh, multinational corporations, the way in which they pay people poor wages and um, cause so much environmental damage. As a Green, I wouldn't just want to reform them, I'd actually want to regulate and tax them out of existence and have a much more relocalized economy, uh, which I think would be a more ethical economy where people are closer to one another and more cooperative with one another. But I think ethics is quite a difficult issue to define what is ethical and what's not. I mean, I'd say something that's unethical is, say, selling tobacco to children, that's clearly unethical. But other things about where money is invested in a given company, that's a bit more subjective. Um, so I think it's a very wide field. Okay, so my um, moral and ethical principles are very much guided by my faith. I'm Hindu and Hinduism teaches to be a good person, to respect other people and, and the culture and community that you live in. I believe in karma, which is um, that every action has a consequence, whether that will be in this life or in the next life. So I try and live by my principles um, to ensure that I do the best that I can um, do and be the best that I can be. Um, being born here in Colchester, both uh, my Indian and Western cultures have an influence in my outlook and the way of life. So in this society I'm, I'm born in, I'm in, from a middle class background, um, I have my basic needs and I have a, a strong family unit who I can uh, talk to and we understand why we do things the way that we do. Um, I'm very much a follower of the rules, so I wouldn't drop litter or park in a disabled parking spot or steal because I know that those things are wrong. So I do understand and I do agree with the statement that for the practice of virtue a modicum of comfort is necessary because it's my stable and strong background which has enabled me to live and understand things the way that I do. But I disagree that um, money and virtue are inevitably linked. I don't believe that um, to be virtuous you must be poor or you must be rich. I believe that people can lead a virtuous life regardless of their financial status or the cultural state, uh, you know, hierarchy that they are in. Um, 
in this society it's urban, it's very money focused, it's all centered around money, you need money for food, for shelter, for water, so I can understand that people think that you need money to survive, but um, I think that those who are perhaps regarded as more virtuous would, uh, you know, they often need more simplistic lies, they can distinguish between what's necessary and what they desire, what they would like, decorative parts of um, their existence. Um, I think that's the hardest thing to understand um, and uh, I think in desperate times I would give up some of my principles for um, perhaps my children, for my family, but I, would, I wouldn't really do that for myself. I think I'd, for myself I'd stick to my principles as much as I can, um, but for my children I may lie or steal in order to protect them or provide for them. Um, but I wouldn't go so far as uh, implicating somebody or hurting somebody else because there would be a limit. So I think that everybody has a moral compass, everybody knows what's right and what's wrong and um, I just think that people need to learn how to use that moral compass and um, yeah, that's what guides them. I've been privileged to work as a family doctor in Colchester for some 40 years. And in that time, I've got to know people in the practice, and my patients who are of all social strata, rich people, poor people, and I've been able to see how they live together and, uh, and also what makes them tick. Uh, and I think it's uh, to say that people who are poor are never be less honest, possibly, than, uh, and then the people who are rich is, is not true. Uh, um, obviously, people who are less well off do have more stress in their life to, to make ends meet, etc. But I can think they can have a very rich life in the family. And often small, uh, poor people make up very much more for their family relationships, possibly the rich people who are in, engaged in making themselves more rich, say, and um, perhaps uh, are not so involved in the community as the poor people. I think we see in, in national life um, that uh, how money can corrupt. I think we've all been appalled by what happens in Parliament with IMPs, etc. And it seems that um, yeah, people who have money will never be, want to keep money to themselves. Uh, and uh, in a way, uh, I've seen national, national uh, firms, international firms, the great international firms nowadays are, are keeping the, the world at, at, at bay, really, by uh, corner the market, say, in, in, in wheat and oil and things like that, and uh, rich people seem to want more for themselves. doesn't mean that the poor people who have to exist uh, are any less righteous or whatever. Uh, and is it more righteous to, to, to have lots of money? I don't know what I w on earth I would do myself if, uh, if I were in the situation of Having no money, I, I, I lived through the last war, I was born before the war, but um, we were very short of food and things like that in the war, but we didn't have to go out searching for things like people have to in some countries. Uh, it's appalling to see what happens in the Middle East, etc., and what's happening now. People without money and without um, food uh, and, and, and who are refugees. I do not know what on earth I would do if I were in that position. Uh, I think that I. I would, would one be honest? Would one, would one have to steal? One would have to. I can only think of the people in the war who had to scrape an existence, uh, and, um, and refugees, and how they had to possibly steal and whatever to get away and, 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 and get, make their escape. So I suppose one would have survive as one would in, in desperate times, but um, let's hope those times will never arrive. Um, certainly nowadays, um, we can't imagine what it must be like, and most people nowadays living so comfortably that they can't imagine what it would be like, and, uh, and even if they took away from their mobile phone, they would think it's the end of the world, uh, and um, I just wonder what, would, what, what one would do if one, one were deprived of a lot of the, uh, what we consider the necessities of life. In the Christian Gospels, there are many examples of Jesus giving priority to the poor. Um, and I think that brings a challenge to the Christian community. 
for me, that's always been very important because we understand as Christian people that everyone is equal in the sight of God. And yet Jesus' command is to love further and to share what we have, whether that's material goods or food or money. So I would hope that the Christian churches, certainly the Anglican churches, would be witnesses to that in Colchester. And many, of course, are. Um, we don't have to look very far from this theatre to discover Christian people working with people who are homeless, with those who are unemployed, especially the great demands made upon the generosity of our church members and other churches, um, creating the food banks and helping with, with food. And so that is part of our living out faithfully our Christian faith, choosing to share what we have with the poor. Indeed, Jesus tells a wonderful story of a, a, a wedding feast where all the great and grand and good of the city are invited to feast and nobody turns up, they all give excuses. Um, and in turn, he says, the, the person who was organising the feast is sent out, to fetch, sends his stewards out to fetch people in from the ditches and waysides and to bring them in to feast together and that's an image of the kingdom of God how life should be if we live faithfully and in love and with charity and um, equality and justice I would like to say something about ethics ethics the perseverance of ethics depends on the one's religious attributes if you, if you are religious and you have experienced religious religion and you have faith, because of the faith, even in the hardest time, you keep saying your prayers and you get through and sail through without any trouble and your troubles are over. Like we sense air, we should experience spirituality. And once we do experience spirituality and, have it, and know it works for us, the spirituality can move mountains. So in really, really hard trouble, hard times, we don't give up our ethics. We persevere and hope for the best and keep praying and we succeed in the end. It has happened in our real life several times and we have been successful and we have been very confident and we know the Divine Spirit always helps us. Thank you. I'm really, really proud to say my temple, Sri Ram Mandir, Hindu, Hindu Center, Hedges Center, has really made me proud because we get school visits, we get different visits from all over the world. And because of my temple, it has made me really strong in my belief, culture, and faith. And I can proudly say that. All the people who come to the temple are really happy because everybody goes from the temple with something positive in their mind. And I wish we can do that forever and ever. I'm a Quaker, which means I'm a member of the Religious Society of Friends. And for me, being a Quaker is more about the way I choose to live my life than necessarily about shared beliefs. Uh, so if I were asked how far my principles would get me if I were faced with d desperate times, um, the short answer to that would be I don't know. But I would really hope that my Quaker values would support me. We have testimonies to uh, equality, simplicity, peace and truth and I would really hope that they would help to guide me. Um, poverty and wealth are relative terms and I believe it's been shown that where there is the greatest inequality in terms of rich and poor that there, there is the greatest unhappiness. Well, Equality or inequality can be seen in terms of uh, relative poverty, um, 
but also uh, unequal access to education um, or equality in terms of gender or race or justice and human rights. Quakers have a long tradition of um, uh, fighting for greater equality um, and they were instrumental in forming the, uh, such organisations as Oxfam and Amnesty International. There have been Quakers in Colchester for over 350 years, but I think Quakers tend to just quietly get on in the background uh, without necessarily being noticed. Although there is one Quaker from the town who will be known to many people in the town, and that's Wilson Marriage who has left his mark in many ways in Colchester, though people may not realise that he was a Quaker. Um, there's a passage from the writing of George Fox, who founded Quakers in the 1650s, that I think could serve as an inspiration to anyone, whether or not they're Quaker, and um, I'd, I'd like to read that. Be patterns, be examples, in all countries, places, islands, nations, wherever you come, that your carriage and life may preach among all sorts of people and to them. Then you will come to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of God in everyone. In desperate times, what would you do to survive? How far will your principles get you before necessity takes over? I ask myself, what would I do? And I find myself thinking in circles about the tricksy and tangled relationship between morality and survival. However rigid or solid our ethical principles might seem, do we really know they won't be warped or twisted in the white heat of the moment when our existence is on the line? When it's life or death? Eat or be eaten? Kill or be killed? It's so easy to judge from a comfortable distance through the filter of a TV screen or hindsight. I turn the spotlight back on myself. As a humanist, I find myself rattled by the implication that without God, there can be no morality, that we humans require an overseeing, all-powerful creator to tell us not to kill each other. An answer I've given many times before. I believe in the good of humans and in the power of community, what we can achieve with the belief in a common humanity as a guiding principle. But it's very easy for me to sit here and say that now, here and now, in my life. I've never lived in a war-torn country. I've never been in a position where I had no roof over my head or been unable to feed myself or a family. What happens to my rosy common humanity when it's dog eat dog? Shente in Good Person tells us, the good in our country cannot remain good. When there's nothing on the plates, the hungry come to blows and asks the gods, how can I remain good when everything is so expensive? Then a link to a news article catches my eye. Poverty impedes cognitive function. New research shows that worrying about money causes cognitive impairments. So now we're being told that it's being poor that leads you to make bad decisions while a government of millionaires makes cuts and slashes that make the poor poorer and decimate our welfare state, founded in the belief that we all pay in and we all take out. We're all in this together. What's to be done, cries Zeus, the gods are drunk. The worse the situation, the better the good person performs in it. Suffering is a great purgative. Is that the voice of Brecht's God or a politician on the news? Max Gerricker can't stand the unemployed. Work shy scroungers. If you haven't got a job, make one. Scatter a box of matches, pick them up. Time and time again, faced with the most extreme of circumstances, Max lives by the principle that you do what you can, even if that means sacrificing your own true identity and living as your dead husband. And a life questioning behind closed doors in the lonely silences in the early hours of the morning who you really are and who you've become. Your instruction, once given me to be good and to live, ripped me in two like a lightning bolt, Shente, to the gods. And I think about myself again, 
about the part of me that wants to be ethical and principled and the part of me that will do what I need to to survive. And how the two can live together side by side. For me. For now. I guess my gut reaction to that is, um, yes indeed, that is the case. Certainly from my own personal reflection on that, I think when push comes to shove, there would be a natural tendency to uh, the survival instinct would have to kick in so for example I don't think I would ever do the adultery and the murder and those kind of things that you would think would be very unvirtuous things to do but I guess if we were starving as a family I would want to provide food for my children so I guess I, I guess I would steal if push came to shove um, I hopefully wouldn't want to steal off individuals but I guess if you had to do a bit of shoplifting you would think twice about well you know shop, shops have a lot of profit and you know it might, they might not miss a loaf of bread here and there. So I guess if you ask me whether I would be absolutely a virtuous person I think poverty does force people into doing some things that they would rather not have to do. But if you, if you kind of, if I reflect on my personal experience as a politician and the people I meet, um, I kind of question some, some part of that statement. In um, a family that I would say is perhaps the most virtuous family, um, and it, it wasn't, wouldn't be the kind of family you'd actually look at and say, oh, they're a very virtuous family. But um, this, this family, um, the, the woman's friend, and was being evicted from her home and she agreed to take her family into her home. She lived in a very modest three bedroom semi detached house and she shared that house for quite a number of weeks, maybe even months, um, with another family. So there were three adults living in the house and there were six children and you kind of think well, how on earth did that work out? How on earth did those families fit together and get on with each other? And I guess there was huge challenges for, during that period um, for all of the individuals that lived in that house. So I guess you might look at her in the street and never pick her out as a very virtuous person, but she's a very virtuous person to me and I've never forgotten that story. Well, you can think of plenty of examples where that's not necessarily the case. The altruism of the prisoners of war in Japan who helped each other and sacrificed for each other. The, uh, the soldier who throws himself on the hand grenade to save his mates. Uh, these are surely the practice of virtue, but hardly uh, regulated by the need for comfort. Maybe to have a prosperous and charitable society, we need the prosperity before the charity. Uh, the most, uh, most charitable giving society is also the most capitalist, the United States of America. Uh, but the paradox here is that the poorest tend to give a higher proportion of their income in charity than uh, the richest 20%. In this country, the poorest 20% do indeed give a higher proportion of their income to charity than the richest 20%. Uh, I look around the community that I represent and you see uh, rotary clubs and trustees of charities. Uh, I've just been to the Tendering Community Transport Scheme where the trustees are not madly wealthy people who are therefore indulging themselves in charitable activity. They are people who have chosen to give up their time to serve the community and therefore I don't accept this um, perhaps rather cynical premise that uh, poverty breeds bestiality. So poverty needn't be an excuse for bad behaviour and indeed I think that disrespects people who are in poverty who are often struggling uh, most altruistically to lead a good life and to do the best for their families and their communities. But the converse of that is that people with wealth, well, we believe in the doctrine of Christian stewardship, which is the idea that the wealth you hold is not your wealth, it's wealth you hold for the wider good of society and for future generations. So very often, particularly the old established families, but this is a very, very strong tradition in our society. And it's always worth remembering somewhat provocatively. Uh, 
the way Margaret Thatcher cited the Good Samaritan when she spoke to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland very controversially, telling them that, of course, the Good Samaritan did have money, he had wealth. It wasn't that wealth was a bad thing, it was about how you used your wealth and how you, uh, how you responsibly stewarded your wealth for the good of the community and for the good of future generations. I've not known discomfort beyond being hungry for a day or not having good sleeping conditions for a week or feeling overtired from work. But even in those brief experiences of discomfort, I know how difficult it is to see beyond myself and think of others. So a modicum of comfort is necessary for a life of virtue. Of course, we need someone also to teach us what is virtuous, what is good. That's why Christians look towards Jesus Christ. And that need for comfort is why, at the end of the 19th century, when defending trade unions, Pope Leo XIII said, we needed not just a minimum wage, but a living wage. Enough money for people to be able to go on holiday and to save and to have comforts at home, and then have the strength to look beyond themselves, to be virtuous. But we could also look at the word comfort differently, because comfort didn't originally mean soft furnishings. Comfort meant with strength, Latin, comfortis, with strength. It takes strength of will and strength of conscience to live a life of virtue. The man who originally said our quote, Thomas Aquinas, wanted to be a priest, but his family didn't like that, so they locked him up in their castle and put women into his bedroom to tempt him to live a different way. But he withstood that temptation. It takes strength comfort to live a life of virtue. Brex, the good person of Sichuan, written before and during the Second World War, explores the ideas of good and bad and how circumstances can define and skew these concepts. The prostitute Shente is visited by the gods and given a small fortune in order for her to follow their demand to be good and drag herself out of the gutter. But people around her are so poor, desperate and corrupt, they immediately take advantage of her charity. Her shop is overrun and she is forced to invent a male alter ego in order to do good and protect her assets. Pretending to be a male cousin allows her to operate the business she's acquired, throw out those that leech from her and eventually set up a drugs empire. Shente is forced to askew her charitable and kind self and be bad in order to protect herself. In thinking about the play, we use the US TV series Breaking Bad as a springboard for our characters and ideas. In Breaking Bad, a terminally ill man turns to making and selling drugs in order to finance his cancer treatment and secure his family's future. In Breaking Bad, there is a scene in which two characters discuss the legality of drugs alcohol and Cuban cigars and it raises an important question in relation to our play who says what is legal and illegal what is good and what is bad the gods tell Shente to be good but within the world of the play goodness is a very fluid concept a quote one of the cast discovered is no one can be good for very long when good is not in demand a sentiment which is certainly true of the half-destroyed world we've created for this production. Does an, does an established idea of good need to change and adapt over time, or is it permanent and concrete? The gods are on a fact-finding mission to find a good person by their own standards, but is it their standards that need changing instead of the world? In this play, Brecht is constantly asking the audience to question what characters do and how they treat each other, whether people are bad through nature or nurture, and whether goodness can survive in a world where people's prime motives are money and self-preservation. Ultimately, this play and our production doesn't attempt to answer these questions. We've been careful to leave the judgments up to our audience, to keep the text open-ended and to present rather than dictate an argument about morality. Brecht is writing in a wide ethical grey area where capitalism is seen to be making everyone bad 
religious is helpless and everyone is out for themselves, but no solutions are offered. We're left knowing what we stand against, but not necessarily what we stand for.